What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode on Keeping It Real with Credit. And on this episode, we got a special guest here to talk about debt collectors, how you can protect yourself, and some tips and tricks on how to talk to them over the phone right now. What's up, everybody? So welcome back. In today's episode, we got Daniel Tam, a consumer attorney here in Miami, Florida, to answer some of your guys' questions when it comes to debt collectors and some of the new things that you should be looking out for this new year of 2018. So as you guys know, if you're new to this channel, consider subscribing because on this channel, we talk from everything from consumer credit, financial advice, and little know-hows on how you can take your credit or financial situation to the next level. So Daniel Tam, uh, you know, why don't you, got, why don't you introduce yourself to the, to the followers? Well, uh, I'm based here in, in Miami-Dade County, and my office is in Miami Beach, uh, but we service uh, most of Florida. Um, what I would say is, you know, uh, how uh, Ray and I met, uh, it was a strange situation. Ray yep. had gotten called from a debt collector, and he ended up paying that debt collector for a number of months, maybe right. over a year. Was it almost, over a year? Yeah, almost a year, yeah. And um, after a while, he figured out that possibly this debt collector wasn't legitimate. So he came to me, we took a look, and we determined that this debt collector was a bogus debt collector. So yeah. we ended up suing this debt collector. Uh, how much, Ray, how much money did you end up uh, paying this debt collector? I think it was a little bit over, I said it in my other videos, over a little bit over like $3,300 or so. Right, right. And so what happened was we ended up suing this debt collector. They were based in, uh, I believe, Palm Beach County. Mm -hmm. And we ended up going after them. And as soon as we sued them, they went out of business, strangely enough. <laughs> it was interesting, yeah. We had to chase them all the way to South Carolina. We sued them in federal court. Yep. We got a great process server. We were able to chase them down and serve them in South Carolina. And Ray got paid. We got paid. So, you know, just to go back a little bit, I was a little nervous at, at the beginning. I mean, not only was I frustrated and very angry because, you know, I felt taken advantage of, but at that moment, you know, when I met Daniel, he told me up front that, you know, most cases, attorneys take cases, you know, uh, you don't have to pay anything up front because obviously they, they understand the law and they know they can expect to win based on the circumstances. And this scenario, you know, was difficult because I had to pay up front and I don't blame him only because this name of a debt collection company, um, you know, wasn't to be found. They weren't like a big company like Midland Funding or such. So since there wasn't like no guarantee and to find them, you know, there was a risk there involved that I had to pay some monies in order for the process server to get some work. But luckily enough, right. you know, the guy was pretty good. Normally, and what Ray's talking about is normally uh, we front the costs of filing the suit, which is about uh, $400 with costs and service uh, process server fees. Um, I asked Ray to pay that because of the fact that we thought that given this was an illegitimate debt collector, most likely we weren't gonna be able to recover anything. However, we were aggressive enough that we were able, we were able to track him down and we found him and we got paid. Right. Um, but uh, that's not gonna happen all the time. Uh, as far as legitimate debt collectors go, um, you know, normally we'll front the cost for that and most uh, consumer attorneys will front the costs for those filing fees. Um, interesting thing about that is, uh, you know, the way we found out that they went out of business here in Florida is there's two places that we look at to determine whether a collector is legitimate. We look at SunBiz, which is the Secretary of State's website right. to see where the, where, whether they're registered as a corporation doing business in this state, and two, we check the Florida Office of Financial Regulations website, and that is online, and that will tell you if a collector is registered as a debt collector in the state of Florida. Now, not every state requires a debt collector to be registered, hmm. but if it is, you should check two places. You should check your uh, Office of Financial Regulation, whatever it's called in your particular state, and you should check your Secretary of State's corporation's website to see if they're registered to do business. And if they're required to and they're not there, that is a telltale sign that it's a bogus debt collector. Right, also, you know, and correct me if I'm wrong, also if you're getting calls from somebody saying that you owe a debt, and you look at your credit report and they're not there, just like it was for me, that might be a little red flag to continue to look in a little bit deeper into that company. Absolutely. If it's a debt that's less than seven years old 
uh, more likely than not, if it's something that a debt collector is collecting, more often than not, it should be shown on your credit report. So that's another flag that you should uh, ask yourself a question, is this legitimate or is it not? Got it. Now, in the process now, you know, we're getting close to tax season and for some reason, all the debt collectors start calling, all oh, the they want, start they, going. They want those tax <laughs> refunds. They know, you, they know money's coming to you right. and they want, they want a part of it. So what are some, some, what are some things that you've seen of bogus debt collectors or even legitimate debt collectors, you know, how far are they really reaching out there? What are some of the things that you've seen? Oh, absolutely. I mean, look, here's another, here's another telltale sign. A, a, a debt collector, is, it, it was similar in a situation like yep. yours where you were, actually told your social security number over the phone. Everything. You didn't, he didn't ask you for it, he told you it. Right. A legitimate debt collector is not going to give you uh, your social security number right. over the phone. Interesting. They're gonna ask you for it to verify before they talk to you often. Uh, if he's gonna tell you, he's trying to scare you into paying something. Another telltale sign is if you ask for an address, they don't give you an address. The name they may give you is a bogus name. They might say ABC Incorporated. Hmm. Um, these are names that you know. If if you can't, if you cannot look it up on the internet, chances are it's not legitimate. Got it. Awesome. And then now, um, when it comes to, I said in my other videos, is you know the moment that you say your name over the phone, you've confirmed to it. Um, what what are some steps or what are, what's kind of like a quick guideline that people can expect when they're talking to a debt collector, maybe for the first time? Yeah, start by asking who you are, uh, what's your name specifically, the name of the collector, what's the name of your company, what's your callback number, because often they're using a spoof number. If they're not legitimate, the number that you're getting online uh, on your phone and caller ID is, uh, is a spoof number, it's not legit. Uh, I always tell my clients, uh, Google that phone number and see what comes up. Always Google that phone number. And that, that'll give you a heads up on whether it's a scam or not because you'll see comments from other people that may tell you it's a scam. Uh, sometimes I get clients that tell me, yeah, they, you know, it came from my same uh, area code. Most collectors are not collecting from your same area code unless it's, you know, the beauty parlor that you forgot to pay. Right. So it's going to be from another state or it's going to be an 800 number. Got it. Also. Now, what happens when you say your name? Let's say you get this call, you, you do say your name. I usually tell people not to say their name. I usually tell people, this is what I tell people is, you know, whoever you are on the phone, whatever you have in your computer screen right now, um, as far as my address and everything goes, send whatever you have to that address. Yeah. If I get it, then I'd respond accordingly. Right, know. I wouldn't give any more information other than that. Um, it's hard to engage in a conversation with a debt collector unless he has at least your name. Mm. So if you do want to engage the debt collector, it's okay. Um, I wouldn't give him any more information than that. Certainly never admit that you uh, own a particular credit card or a particular debt. Tell, you know, tell them, obviously, look, a debt collector under the FDCPA, if they are a debt collector and not the original creditor calling you, they have, and the first contact that you get from this collector is by telephone, hmm. they have five days to send you a letter. Uh, from the a, moment they call you. From the moment they call you. So yeah. it's called the Dunning letter, and they have to tell you uh, what the debt is, the original creditor, and that you have, and basically what's called G notice requirements, that you have 30 days uh, to dispute the debt, right. and that if you, dis if you choose to dispute the debt, do so in writing, and I, I always suggest that you do it by certified mail. Um, more often than not, if these people call you and you don't get that letter, another telltale, telltale sign, and you don't recognize the name of that collector, it's another telltale sign that it's not legitimate. Got it. Yeah, I, there you go, guys. You heard it from him himself. Do not dispute online because you give up a lot of your rights under the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Like I've said before, I'll leave a link to that video uh, so, that I got, so that you guys can go back to that. Uh, but other than that, now... Uh, I definitely just tell them that you dispute it on uh, the phone call. Got it. But they also still, they're still required no matter what to send you that uh, follow-up letter. Got it. Now, what's going to happen is a lot of times if you say you dispute it, um, they're going to come back at you very argumentative-like and they're going to say, oh, you're refusing to pay. I want to mark down that you're refusing to pay. Right. A lot of people get scared right there and right. say, uh, and then they go back, I'm not refusing to pay, I'm not refusing to pay. Just tell them, write down whatever you're gonna write down. I'm disputing, 
send me the letter like you're required to send me that letter. There you go. So see, without giving no information, just tell them to go buy what they have there. Now, we do have some people in the comments from the videos before saying that, you know, uh, they'll go as far as saying, uh, you know, it's the moral thing to do and stuff like that. But, you know, what do you say to, to that when it comes to a third party collecting on, a, on, on your debt and them possibly getting aggressive or, you know, what do you think well, about also, that? Also, is it moral for them to, you know, I know it's good business, but is it moral for them when they're purchasing now? And I, I have in my possession a number of uh, purchase and sale agreements between debt collectors and, um, and uh, the original creditors. And some of the larger ones are buying these debts at significant discounts. We're talking less than 10 cents on the dollar, some less than five cents on the dollar. Right. So we're talking about, is it moral for them to be asking for the full balance when they paid five or 10 <laughs> cents on the dollar? <laughs> right, you know? it's that. So now, uh, you know, when, when they are asking for that, um, you know, let's talk a little bit more about, you know, just so we can go over the steps on statute of limitations. Sure. I know it varies by state and by debt, uh, you know, type of debt. Um, but, you know, what's another thing? What can the consumer do on their end to make sure that, you know, if the debt is still valid or not. That they're not paying something that's beyond the statute of right, limitations. Right, exactly. Start with your credit report. Always check your credit, you know, and, and Ray's probably already told you this in a previous video, but you gotta check your credit report a minimum of once a year. I tell people every six months. You know, if you see a debt that, that's on there and you see that the date of first delinquency is, for example, in the state of Florida, uh, if it's more than five years, you know, and someone's still trying to collect on it, don't admit to anything and don't pay it because it's not something that can be enforced. Now, you may decide that you wanna pay it anyway, but understand that if you start making payments on it, it will reset the statute of limitations. In most states, that will reset the statute of limitations and you're gonna start that period all over again. If you decide not to pay, then they've got a new period in which they can come after you and sue you. So it does, it's not illegal for them to ask you to pay something that's beyond the statute of limitations. The statute of limitations says that after a certain period of time, they can no longer sue you to collect that debt. Got it. Now, let's talk a little bit more, you know, for the individuals that do, and they do pay a debt, whether it's past the statute of limitations or not. Just to go over, and I've said it in these videos before, but just so they can hear from you, once you pay that debt, what happens to your credit report or what goes on after that? Well, uh, for the most part, um, it will still show um, the delinquencies won't come off, um, which is why a lot of people should, and it doesn't happen all the time, but you should make the request anyway that they do a deletion in return for your payment on that account. Some will do it, some will not. Um, there is no obligation of any creditor to report anything on your credit report ever. So mm. there's no reason for it to even stay on there. So they have no reason, they can't tell you that we're not allowed to delete it. They can do whatever they want if they want to, but they're choosing not to. Um, it hurts the consumer in the long run, yes. Um, but your account will show uh, that it's paid. It might, if you settle for less than the full balance, it'll show paid for less than the full balance. Right. Um, that might give your score a little bump, but it will, because the balance will be zeroed out, but ultimately those delinquencies will still hurt you when you're applying for loans in the future. Right, and like I said in my other videos before, the FICO scoring models are systems that the banks are using today, which is not the new one, not FICO score model eight or nine, at least not everybody subscribing to those, will still identify that collection, whether paid or not, as negative towards your account, and that's 35% of your score. So that right, that right there is, is still gonna hurt you at that end. So just be very careful as how you analyze your collections and who you're talking to over the phone or whatnot, because obviously, you know, we wanna, you know, cover all the all our tracks before we go ahead and fork up that debit card or credit yeah. card, right? And more often than not, you're not gonna get original creditors to agree to delete. The big banks uh, make their money off poor credit. Right. So they're not, they're not gonna agree to delete uh, um, anything off of your credit report. The collectors, it varies from collector to collector, but there are a number of collectors out there uh, and debt buyers out there that will delete in response to a right. payment. Now, one thing that I'm scared of that though is, is when you get to the point when you're asking for payment for deletion and all that, by then- Writing, you've already, get it in writing. Yeah, always get it in writing. But by then you run the risk of them not doing it because by then, you 
you verified exactly who you are and all that other stuff. So it's kind of like a risk. You're rolling the dice on that. It is. It is. But you're also getting some finality with it. There are right. some situations where you think if there's if there's one thing that's holding you back and you need to just get it off uh, the credit report, uh, then it's you know I I wouldn't dissuade anybody from doing that. Got it. Now, what is one of the most maybe off the top of your head one of the most crazy cases you sign or one of the most creative it's yours. collectors? It's yours. Really? It's yours. Come on. <laughs> that I have to chase. A collector across state lines to get you paid? Absolutely. I never had to do that before, you know? That, and that was actually wow. fun. I, I, I tell, and I told Ray, I was, I was hesitant to take this case in the first place, not, yeah, not, not, not for Ray, but you know, I, not for me, but for Ray, because I told Ray, you know, you may, not, you may not get the satisfaction that you want out of this because of the fact that it's a fly-by-night operation. But the fact of the matter is, you know, I've got a soft spot, a soft spot for military members. I, I, I you know, Thank people, you. they work, uh, you know, they, they defend this country with their lives. And so I really, you know, I was happy to take his case. I just told him, you know, don't get your hopes up. Right. And, um, you know, we were just, Man. we were just really aggressive. About it. We were really angry because <laughs> the thing that really angered us the most, I think, was the fact that the, literally right after we filed the suit, they closed up shop. That's crazy. Right after yeah. we served, right after we tried to get the process server up over there, that they closed up shop. So um, that's why we really, really pushed to try to track these guys down. Now, it's not the first time that I've gotten a debt collector to close up shop in the state. We've gotten default judgments against uh, other collectors, and they've wow. chosen to give up their uh, license with the Office of Financial Regulation rather than pay, rather than pay up. Oh, and it's wow. not even a lot of money, but they just, they just didn't want to do it. And they know that, uh, in the state of Florida at least, that uh, a judgment um, against them under the FDCPA is is grounds for revocation of your license. So they just basically chose to just give it up. It's crazy, so keep in mind, these people, just to reiterate back, these people had an attorney company name can I say the name? I can say them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Franklin Cohn and Albright. So, you know. And, all... and, and none of the people involved uh, behind this, co this so-called firm or company <laughs> or agency was named Franklin, Cohen, or Albright. And, <laughs> exactly. that, and, and I will tell you that that happens a lot where they just make up the names. And, and I still got some of those voicemails. Uh, maybe I'll put it at the end of the video recorded. It kind of reminds me of everything. But, you know, the guy used to always finish his threats on my voicemail like, govern yourself accordingly or little things like that and uh you know it, it really got me mad when at the end of the day i found out i got an email from them when i asked for proof and it had the little word doc like little edit uh you know frame around it that i can adjust it was just uh you know you know they messed with the wrong one and because of that and because of the help of daniel tam is where i've made this youtube channel i vowed that this would never happen to me again and if it happened to me it's happening to some of you guys out there so my mission with this channel is to definitely help you guys out understand credit a little bit better so that you guys won't be afraid to answer the phone uh to a debt collector so that you can navigate your way through you know deciding you know me working with Husto in the past and the, and the credit restoration company i used to have you know, people used to decide whether to buy food or to pay this debt collector or get kicked out of their house sleeping in their car because of a debt collector bothering them. And it shouldn't be that way. You know, we have rights and regulations that protect us. I got a taste of how it protected me, and I'm thankful for that. And, uh, you know, this is what this channel is definitely dedicated to. So now, Daniel, you know, what, what else you got going on? Is there anything else that you're a part of? Or is there any, I know you consult with a lot of your team of attorneys or whatnot as far as you know different things to look out for i remember you used to tell me hey ray you know if your clients are getting x y and z make sure you send them over to me but what are some things that they can look out for i mean look the, the you know it's re it's just really important that everybody uh, educate themselves and one of the things is you know educate yourself by watching the videos that ray puts up but also read the laws that Ray's talking about, the right. FTCPA, the FCRA. The FTCPA lists all the rules that they can't violate. Look, they can't threaten to arrest you. Now, that doesn't mean you can't actually can't get arrested over a debt. Um, it has happened, but not by uh, not paying the debt. What happens is if you get sued in some states, some judges are aggressive, and if you don't show up to court, they'll issue a warrant for your arrest. That's not getting arrested over the debt. It's just because you didn't not, show up. That's, right. not, that's just not obeying a court order. Uh, but you can't get arrested for the civil, it's a civil, it's a contract debt. 
uh, whether it's credit cards, loans, medical debt, it's a, it's a debt. You're not going to get arrested for the debt itself. So if you're getting threatened by a collector uh, with arrest, that's just a load of BS. Right. Now, are companies nowadays, even though they know that accounts are old or not collectible at the moment, are they still suing people or sending summons just to scare them? Oh, oh. Um, oh gosh, we had a case. Um, we had a case um, of a debt collector. I can't recall it off the top of my head, but this was back in 2011 or 2010. They're out of business now. They called themselves like an arbitration firm, but they were, mm. but they weren't even, and they weren't even a law firm, or they were just a debt collection right. agency like Franklin Cohen and Albright. And they were out of Nevada, and they were running this scam in I think either Naples or Fort Myers, and they got a lot of people. They would just send fake summonses out. And um, it, it scared a lot of people into paying, but it had the effect of actually scaring a few people to show up in court. And because they showed up in court, the court figured it out mm. and shut them down in <laughs> Naples. So they wow. tried to pull it again, and this was before it came to my attention. They tried to pull it again in Palm Beach County, and it came to one of my clients. And we ended up suing them and, and basically putting them out of business in Florida altogether. Wow, I'm telling you guys, they're getting pretty creative, so that's just an additional. Just because they come over your phone, reading your name, social, and all that, that still doesn't mean anything. Go through the proper process. Now, if, if, you're, if you do get a summons, if a process server sh uh, shows up, uh, now, normally you're not gonna get a summons by mail, and it depends on your state. Mm. I, when Everything that I'm talking to you about here right now, I'm talking about my experience as an attorney here in Florida. Right. Um, if you're gonna get served, most often, it's going to be with a process server showing up at your door, okay? If you're getting a, a, if you're getting a summons in the mail, you, have, you should question it before you do anything. But if it's a process server showing up, Definitely do not ignore it. Um, if there's a court date involved, like there are in small claims cases, there's always gonna be a court date to show up. Don't ignore it. That is the worst thing you can do. You can ignore all the collection calls you want. That's your choice. But don't ignore the summons because if you don't show up in court, a default judgment's gonna be entered against you. And that's 20 years that that judgment's gonna be uh, 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 valid. And at least seven to 10 years, it's gonna be on your credit report. So you wanna avoid that. Right. Um, you know, I tell people the minute you get a summons, call an attorney in your area. If right. you're in my area, obviously, I'm happy to take your call, but call an attorney immediately. Right, you wanna call them immediately, and then in, in addition to that, you know, uh, do your little bit of research so that way maybe you know what the attorney is talking about or maybe you know you can educate yourself and maybe that's not going to happen to you or you might just start a YouTube channel like this one and help additional people out. So other than that, you know, just to finish off, a quick checklist for people um, when they're calling. So if they, get a, if they get a phone call from a debt collector, you know, one of the first things we talked about was never admit to it. Right. Never admit to the debt. Um, if anything, ask them to send whatever they have by mail to the address on whatever is on their computer screen, correct? Absolutely. And they're required to do that. Right. They're required to do that within five days. Cool. Uh, if they're the debt collector and not the original creditor. Um, some of you out there may have payday loans. Um, a lot of times, those are the biggest scam calls that you're gonna get. And it'll be payday loans that they'll be talking oh, about from yeah. years ago, and you're not even sure you took out the payday loan. <laughs> but because that information gets sold over and over again, you're gonna get that question, where, or you're gonna get that response from them saying, oh, I've got your social right here, and they're gonna tell you what it is, and they're just gonna scare you into paying. Right. Um, and it happens more often than not. And more often than not, the people you're paying are not even in the United States. Jesus. Now, after that, once you, if you do get something in the mail, respond back with a dispute letter. Absolutely. So disputing basically, you know, under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, if anything is unverifiable, inaccurate, or incomplete, and must be corrected or removed, right, based on that. So in general, that dispute letter, you should be asking for, you know, some sort of information, like contract with your name and signature for it. You know, at the end of the day, they have the burden of proof to you that you actually owe the debt, am I correct? Absolutely, but you know, uh, <clears throat> they may not give it to you. They may give you, they, they, normally you'll just get uh, a few account statements um, and a notice from them that they purchased the debt and this is who they purchased it from. Um, some people verify it by just calling the original creditor and the original creditor will say, yes, we, we sold it to so-and-so. But um, more often than not, what you'll end up getting is just a bunch of account statements. Got it, and is that enough? 
based on? Uh, the law says that they're, they're not required to put, to give you that much uh, to verify the debt. They can verify just basically letting you know who they bought it from, what the actual amount is, and um, you know some account statements. Now, what would you suggest? Because usually, typically, people would send a method of verification letter. So saying how and who'd you talk to and all this stuff. Well, there'd be two things. I mean, they, there's two different types of letters. You, you know, you know you're, if you're looking at through your credit report, you might be disputing something with the credit bureau. Um, and then you're going to be disputing something with the original, uh, with the collector that's uh, furnishing the information uh, to the credit bureaus. So what's going to happen is the debt collector will actually end up getting the letter twice. He'll get it one, once from you and he'll get it once from the credit bureau because the credit bureau is required to send them uh, the, uh, the well, dispute once got... they get it. They do it electronically. Most collectors get it electronically from the credit bureaus, but they're required to get that information. Um, if you send... Uh, any documentation to the credit bureaus of, of the reasons why you dispute it, they're even required to send that information to the collector as well. Um, but what's going to happen is, uh, you know, they have to respond in some way. They cannot continue to collect that debt until they respond. Some may just stop collecting altogether, and that's happened to a number of my clients. They, you know, we've we've handled disputes for them, or they've done the disputes. We've told them to dispute it themselves, and they just stop collecting it altogether. Mm. Um, and that's their right. If just because they don't respond doesn't mean that they've done something wrong. What it means is they can't but they cannot continue to collect unless they've given you some information in response to that under the FDCPA. Nice. And then, um, and then towards the end, once you've exhausted all avenues of approach, then I, you know, usually at that point in time, I, I suggest my clients to go ahead and try to figure out a, some sort of uh, pay for deletion, um, some sort of payment plan, something that benefits both the collection agency and you at that point. Look, any amount you give them automatically benefits the debt buyer. They're getting they, it for pennies on the top. <laughs> because, yeah, exactly. You know? They know. And look, the bottom line is that most collection agencies, the, the collectors work on commission. Right. You know, they're, they're, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hybrid salary commission structure for a lot of these collectors. So they're, gonna, they're making money, but they need to make their commissions. And the more you pay, the more they get. Right. Now, one last thing. This myth and I'm calling it a myth because I haven't yet confirmed it. I'm just going based on the results and that I got in once I was working in the credit restoration company. And this, we're talking about hospital bills, hospital collections. Mm -hmm. Now with hospital collections, with me, they had a higher rate of being removed. And I think that because of that, it was because of the HIPAA laws. When you're asking for validation or proof that we owe the debt to the third party, HIPAA laws protect your medical records and therefore they can't prove and that's why it was deleted. Is well, that um, I, I wouldn't say that exactly. Um, it, you know, th I don't know the rate of, of deletions uh, compared to the amount of disputes. Right. What, I, what I will tell you is, is that collectors do have a lot of leeway with their, uh, with their um, clients, the, med uh, the hospitals and the, uh, the medical billers, because you've given them that long sheet of rights that, and, and uh, rights and responsibilities that you never read when you go in and electronically sign more often than not these days at hospitals has language in there that says that, the, that this information can be transferred to collectors for mm. the purposes of collection. Got it. All right. So that's interesting. So make sure you research that and read that, guys, if you if you are in a situation like that. But don't forget, I would always go through the dis dispute process first, because at the end of the day, you know, uh, by fact of error, you know, it can be removed and, you know, bettering your credit in the long run. So other than that, guys, thank you guys so much for joining us. Daniel, thank you for joining me today. Hopefully we'll have you in continuation to the show. If you guys like what he was talking about would you like to know more information about what he has to say i'll leave his email um in the description below and if and his phone number for those of you guys in the state of florida that are looking for more questions or answers or if you have a case